Mr. Mark Selby, how are we, sir? Very good, Mr. Matthew Gordon. It's been quite a long time since we've done our... It has been a long time, but you've been yes. traveling the world, and I'm excited to hear what you learned at uh, LME in London last week. Now, you've got a, you're have got up in Timmins. You've got a rather exciting week uh, lined up there, haven't you? Yes. Yep. Nope. Good couple of days of meetings down here, and then got people coming through town next week from, from overseas. So, yeah, it's going to be a, a busy, jam-packed week before our Thanksgiving weekend uh, next weekend. So... Okay. Well, I look forward to hearing all about those uh, meetings uh, maybe next time around. But, but first, we're going to whiz through this today. You've got a hard stop. You've got people um, waiting for you there. So what do we need to know? The world of nickel price. Yep. So good good week, LME week last week. That's always a good touch point for me. You get producers, consumers, traders, all the commodity analysts in the room at the same time. Consensus is always wrong. And then you just have to guess whether you're, the, the market's going to be higher or lower than consensus for nickel. Uh, consensus was actually lower than where we are right now. So that's a good sign. And I, I think we're well supported below that. So that's a, another good sign that we should see uh, stronger prices going forward. And actually, you know, during the week, week, uh, we did see prices moved uh, almost a dollar a pound or over $2,000 a ton. We popped up over $18,000 a ton for the first time in many, many months, breaking out of that sixteen to 16500 range uh, where we've been for quite a while. Uh, I think uh, we had the big last week was a big week off Chinese holiday, and I think you know some traders were nervous about being short going into that holiday uh, because again this ore supply issue continues to come to the fore, and so uh, you know despite the fact that we've seen some relative weakness in demand both on the stainless and, and sulfate prices again China's um, up until the stimulus announcement uh, a week or two ago uh, things things were still a little soft, um, but uh, I think. The, the the one of the big takeaways from LA Me Week was a lot of participants were surprised um, at how m more optimistic most uh, a lot of people from China were. You know, historically, I would say the last two or three LME weeks, most uh, Chinese companies were pretty, uh, you know, sort of down, sort of not particularly excited about where things were. You know that you know the the economy is slowing. Property is an issue, um, but I think you know that the government, you know, has, in the words of uh, Hank Paulson, you know, got enough big, big enough bazooka out that maybe is starting to change the sentiment um, in China in terms of where the economy is headed, which will be great for commodity prices. And again, we we saw commodity prices move across the board off the back of that. Right. So um, all all the important people that you'd expect to see there were in town. Lots of separate, desperate meetings going on, but the gen general. Mood and consensus is positive in the space. Um, do you do you concur with that? Because you've got a kind of a, quite an aggressive um, target you've set yourself by the end of the year. You're still sticking with that? Well, yeah, no, no, I 100% concur in terms of you know I I think that interest rate cuts we've seen in the West, you know, combined with the stimulus in China, you know, is what's required to sort of shift the momentum. Uh, I think on the demand side, um, you know, I had a double digit demand growth. Uh, INSG just updated their numbers. I think we're trading a sort of first half around five and a half percent. The the continued weakness in lithium prices is really dampening any kind of restocking activity in the battery sector. We saw a little bit of it in February, March, and then it's kind of subsided. So again, I think we're getting to a bottom here. I'm not sure we'll get to the ten percent uh, demand forecast, but I'm still comfortable in the in the twenty thousand uh, uh, dollar you know price forecast uh, by year end. Right, and you, we we talk about NSG uh, quite a bit on here in terms of the the factors that they are looking to like, again. Do, do you think they're going to be right? Yeah. So so the, the the good. I mean, they have their monthly reports, right, which are looking back, and so those are always sort of a you know a decent track of in terms of where supply and demand is. Um, uh, again, really starting to see mine supply level off with the cuts elsewhere, and Indonesia is really slowing down. Uh, the key thing is their forecast. Um, they, they, they meet twice a year, put out a forecast uh, for the coming year. It's always usually not nearly aggressive enough. It's, again, close to the middle. Um, they don't try and make a bold call either up or down. Um, so they have demand going up 5% next year, which, again, I think is half of what it will be, particularly if we undershoot this year. And on the supply side, um, you know, they only have supply going up a few percentage points. And so the key thing with their forecast is they never have a disruption allowance. Every analyst has a three to 5% disruption allowance for nickel. They don't add it in. And when you add it in, 20, their forecast, even with the low demand forecast, is for a deficit next year. So uh, uh, again, you know, 
the, the consensus is not there, but you know, these are, you know, the INSG G numbers. And so, you know, I, again, I think that is again, a bullish sign that we will see the market be, you know, much tighter than we expect. And the key driver of it, we talked about it like last time we, we talked, we got another data point um, from Indonesia and the Philippines. Indonesia's imports uh, of ore from the Philippines went up again. You know, the annualized run rate of how much ore is Indo Indonesia importing from the Philippines is 5% of global supply, right? This would be like, you know, now that Indonesia is kind of the Saudi Arabia of nickel, that would be like Saudi Arabia importing oil from Iran or Iraq to keep its refineries full. You know, that's the reality of the market. You know, that's, you know, again, this, you know, market overhang of Indonesia will just pump out as much ore as, as you know, as it can and it's going to flood the market, you know, is just wrong. Indonesia is limiting the amount of ore that's coming out. They're struggling to get the grade that they want, you know, through their plants. And so that's why they're taking, the Philippines is, you know, is, is, you know, the best grade saprolite is like one and a half percent, you know, on in any kind of quantity. And so the fact that they're pulling that material in from the Philippines really suggests, you know, that they're, they are really struggling in terms of quality. And again, I think that's what's going to set up a big squeeze in November and December once the Philippine rainy season really kicks in. The Chinese will want that ore from the Philippines. The Indonesians will want that ore from the Philippines. And there's only so much to go around. And so, you know, that's why even though with demand undershooting, I'm still confident that we're going to get to that 20 back to that $20,000 a ton price level. And the, the price movement we saw over the last few weeks is, is kind of the, the first leg up in that. And, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes through November and December. So this is real fundamental disruption. This isn't a case, as you say, of, of se seasonal rains here. Um, this is lower grades, presumably therefore higher costs. So why all the, all the big shouting from the pulpit from Indonesia about being the, the OPEC of nickel? Oh, I mean, again, they've, they've ramped up, you know, pretty significantly and they're, you know, still going to be, they'll end this year at 60, 60, 65% of global supply. So, you know, they are the, definitely the, you know, the 200 pound gorilla in the market, but going forward, their ability, you know, again, a lot of analysts have some pretty healthy uh, production growth numbers coming out of Indonesia. And that we will see that from HPAL. We're going to see hundreds of thousands of tons of capacity from HPAL plants come on, come online, but it'll be, you know, offset to some extent by, by these declining ore grades for the, for the, for the plants that produce nickel pig iron. And Matt, so so again, I think it's going to be interesting last three months going into the quarter, and I think it'll be you know set the stage for a pretty interesting twenty twenty five. Are you still sticking by your price forecast for the end of the year? Yep, twenty thousand bucks. We'll see it before December thirty first. Not sure how soon before <laughs> heard here for us, folks, but it will it will get there at some point. It's, I mean, we already got there once in April, you know, but we will get back there on a more sustained basis yeah. at the end of this year. Okay. Okay. And one of the other things kind of driving that lots of conversation around EVs, hybrids, however you want to f frame it, is that still going to be a big contribution towards them um, hitting those numbers? Yeah. Uh, again, you know, things have definitely slowed down. You know, you're seeing um, the, you know, August numbers that came out in, in September, again, globally, you know, 20% year, year to date, um, over, year over year. Now, the big thing is plug-in hybrids up 46%, battery EVs only up 10%. So uh, again, not worried about that. Double digit demand growth is 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 as much as the analysts had braved to have in their forecasts before. So if the actual market has come down to that level, then you know then then things think things have lined up there. Again, one of the big impacts this year, you know, this year year over year, was the fact that Germany pulled subsidies, and so you saw a bunch of um, you know distortions in demand because of that the removal of the subsidies. They put some partial subsidies back in in September. So again, I think we'll be all pleasantly surprised to see you know. Uh, you know, EVs and 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 plug-in hybrids, you know, pop back up to the fifteen to twenty percent range, you know, next year. Right, and, and I guess, um, well, slightly towards that end, and also definitely definitely related is, is the uh, uh, U.S. Department of uh, Energy um, handing out, it seems, uh, three billion bucks to critical mineral projects in the U.S. Starting to get a bit serious over there. Yeah, uh, again, one of the themes we've talked about many many times. The U.S. government sees critical minerals as a national security issue. They will continue to throw money at mines and plants until they see lots and of mines and plants get built. That's the bottom line. And so now DOE only is available to assets that are physically located in the U.S. So unfortunately, none of that round of money is coming north to Canada. But it should give you an idea of the kind of quantums uh, that, you know, that they're they're looking at to do one one 
one project in the nickel space. Somebody looking to pull nickel out of tailings at Eagle. Eagle only mined 250,000 tons of nickel to date. They probably recovered 90%, 85 to 90% of it. And so there's not that much left in the tailing. And that that company got $166 million from, from the U.S. government. So so again, really underscoring that, you know, this is something they're taking seriously. Um, and, the, and the key piece is, you know, obviously that was a good piece. Right, okay. Yep, go ahead. Oh, no, good piece of news to kick off. The no, go for it. Um, and I'll go quickly through this because there was a lot of news coming out in September. This is one month where we shouldn't have, have, have skipped skipped a session. So first off, from us, Canada Nickel, I won't go into too much detail because we've, we've talked a couple times on Canada Nickel in the interim. Uh, we got a letter of intent from Export Development Canada for $500 million U.S. in debt funding, and then a second second one for another $500 million Canadian funding. You know, that's just, just under $900 million U.S. dollars in terms of uh, funding. We still have to go through a bunch of due diligence, but, you know, the fact that they've let us announce it, you know, is, suggests they're confident that, we'll, you know, we'll get through there to the end. We put a whole new advisory board together for our downstream business with some very serious uh, stainless and alloy steel people. Uh, again, you know, the market needs low carbon products in these industries. The market needs North American sources of, of chromium. And, you know, this plant will be able to deliver it. We put out expir- expiration results from seven different properties. Again, most juniors happy to have one or two good properties. We, we, you know, we put out drilling results from seven. Um, and then lastly, and most importantly, uh, we announced at the end of the month that we uh, started filing our environmental impact statement. Uh, once that's done, which would be in about six weeks, that completes the second phase of the permitting process um, and then puts the government on a maximum of 365 days. So, you know, that's a huge milestone for us and, uh, you know, is l- looking forward to getting that done. You guys are really ramping up speed now. I mean, I think that announcement of uh, near down a, a billion bucks from the Canadian government to move things along kind of Got people are super excited, but um, on the ground, um, also moving things forward. Uh, not, not least, I was kind of intrigued by the, um, in the additions to the team as well. That 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 was that is well. You must be pleased at being able to track that quality of personnel, no? No, one hundred percent. No, and again, I think that that speaks to the quality of the opportunity to have guys who you know one who built the last. Greenfield stainless steel mill in North America, you know, another guy who's been involved in uh, the alloy steel industry for, you know, 30 plus years at a senior level, um, you know, is coming to get involved in our venture, I think speaks to the the quality of the opportunity. So, no, it's been great. And and again, there's lots of other good news out. Uh, Magna Metals, um, you know, who had picked up the Green Hill mine, they actually picked up the rest of the assets from KGHM. Uh, most of the Magna team are ex FNX, and then FNX uh, owned these um, deposits before they merged with Quadra. Uh, I worked at Quadra, worked on that merger uh, back about 15 years ago. Uh, so good to see those operations um, in in FNX in Magna's hands. Um, you know, we'll put more focus on those, um, and it'll be nice to see. You know, hopefully some more production. Now there'll be more copper and PGMs, the nickel. But uh, again, good to see. You know those 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 operations in good good Canadian hands that'll you know continue to push them forward. In Australia, Western Mines Group, you know they've got a big ultra mafic, um, some some good results um, again through there. They've got a little bit of high grade um, that some of the Australian ultra mafics seem to have around the edges, and so good to see results there. Other new ones in Canada, first time talking about. I think may have mentioned briefly a long time ago. Perseverance Metals. Basically, you know, an all-star exploration team, um, you know, from di- different companies um, over the last 15 years. And so they've picked up some high-grade properties, one of which is in central Quebec. Um, and the first first results there, you know, confirmed some of the historic drilling. So it was good to see. Uh, SPC Metals, uh, we've talked about their Sudbury properties. Uh, what was interesting is they released re- summer re- results from summer exploration up at the Muskox property in Nunavut. It's a you know remote location, but again, one of the few places where you can get, you know, bang rocks and get nickel um, and some pretty flashy, you know, high grade nickel, high grade copper and high grade PGM showings, you know, which had been identified in the past. It'll be interesting to see how those, how those evolve going forward. And they also put out some good results um, from uh, their West Gray, in which there's their project in Sudbury that they're continuing to infill. And last but not least, on the drilling results uh, front, uh, Power Metals, Terry Lynch's company, um, has put out uh, the best interval to date, you know, 32 meters of 3.5% copper, over 10 grams uh, PGMs, uh, and a little bit of nickel and gold um, with some even higher grade intervals, you know, with with um, some <laughs> some very very good uh, good intersections. Anytime you can pull off eleven meters of eight percent copper with with some 
platinum group metals associated with it. It's pretty good. So it'll be, again, interesting to see sort of how the size of those lenses um, will evolve, but uh, nice to see some some good results um, and uh, and uh, uh, look forward to see, seeing more of them. They, they, they had some additional drilling um, that they haven't published the assay results yet, so it will be good to see. Well, there we go, Mike. Yeah, that, was, that really was a romp through this because uh, you, your your time's short uh, today. You're up there. You've got some important meetings happening this week, some good meetings happening this week um, up, up in Timmins. So um, we'll let you crack on, get on with those, and we'll see you soon. Sounds good, sir.